today's program features. Uh, good morning, or afternoon, I guess, and well, uh, thank you for uh, having us here. I um, kind of brought back a memory when they handed up, uh, or showed this sign a bit earlier. Uh, seven years ago, when I moved into the neighborhood of Bonton, uh, was the only white person living there at the time, and so, as you can imagine, it kind of drew a lot of attention. Um, I had a lot of people come and introduce themselves uh, to me, and I thought, wow, what, what a friendly neighborhood. Everybody stopped by to say hi. Uh, my next-door neighbor kindly and shortly after told me that the reason everybody was stopping by because they were convinced I was one of three things. I, I was either the police, the police, or a cop. <laughs> And so uh, I still am very grateful for our police officers, but I do not have a thank a cop sign in my front yard because I'm pretty sure that might convince them that I am, in fact, some sort of law enforcement, which I'm, uh, which I'm not. Um, I, I want to, I have a really short period of time today to tell you a really big story. Um, I think one of the things that plagues our modern culture is that we have forgotten how to ask really deep questions. We ask shallow questions that address the superficial uh, symptoms of problems, but rarely do we ask the deeper questions behind the question. And so one of the things that they asked me to do today is to share with you how Bonton Farms are bringing real solutions, things that change things permanently to um, South Dallas and to our neighborhood of Bonton. But to do that and not to understand how we got there, why things are the way they are, would not be addressing the root cause of why that symptom of we have people that are without food, we have people that are without healthy food, people that don't have access to food. Why is that the case? And so I want to back up with a little bit of time that I have and just kind of tell you a bit of a story. Uh, for those of you that don't know, our city is in, uh, up, up, we have we face some ominous challenges. Despite a lot of great organizations and a lot of money and a lot of efforts, uh, poverty in our, in our city continues to grow unabated. Um, this was just a, one of about 40 uh, newspaper titles that I could have pulled from, but uh, Dallas, uh, out of the 10 largest cities in the United States, we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the nation, not something that any of us are proud of, but it's the facts. Um, this is a, a map of our city and opportunity zones. You can see um, the red areas are some of the most distressed neighborhoods in our city, and I wanted you to see that because I want you to see where they're located. Pay really close attention to the colors and where they're located because the NEPS map is where our city lives racially. And so it just so happens that a big part of the challenged neighbor, the most challenged neighborhoods we have are uh, African American and Hispanic neighborhoods. And so we have this history, um, and this probably is a, a comfortable conversation to have for a lot of people, but I think it's a very important conversation to have, is we have a history in our country and in our city uh, where we come from a background where we didn't always believe that all people were created equal. And that um, ominous beginning of our history continues to affect us today. Um, Dallas is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. There's a lot of people, and I believe this firmly, that a lot of the challenges that we have in our city today exist simply because people don't understand what happens in those neighborhoods that we talked about earlier because they're removed from where everybody else lives. And so today I want to give you a little bit of a brief history of how the Bonton neighborhood was formed. So shortly after Emancipation Proclamation, when free slaves were establishing neighborhoods, one of the most attractive parts of town for them to start building was along the Trinity floodplain. It was an area where nobody else would build, and so freed slaves would begin building their communities around, along the Trinity River. In fact, Kim is from I think the most famous historical neighborhood called Joppy, um, which is just next door to Bonton across the river. And uh, Bonton was formed not too long after that. As Dallas started to form and prosper as a city, a lot of people from those communities began trying to move closer to city center. While Bonton's only about seven minutes south of downtown, at the turn of the century, seven minutes today was, was quite a ways to go. And so they started trying to build encampments closer to downtown, and that was not received at, 
in our city and culture at the time. And so they began bombing those encampments. Um, this is a, a newspaper article. You might not, not be able to see it, but it's from March 1943, I believe. So it's not that long ago. Uh, one of the things that happened after that is the mayor at the time thought, we need to figure out a way of a method to keep the people where they are. So again, we don't have people that talk or think that way so much, at least publicly today, but we have a situation where you can see in this newspaper, not only does it say public housing demanded for Dallas Negroes, but below it, it says bombing of homes sets off proposal by mayor. So the fact is, is that the solution to trying to keep African Americans from moving closer to the rest of the city was to come up with a plan to keep them where they were. That plan, um, let me go back, that plan included the proposal to build two public housing developments in the neighborhood of Bonton. So Bonton was awarded uh, two public housing developments. One was called Turner Courts, the other was called Rhodes Terrace. Um, it grew Bonton from about 1,200 residents to about 6,000 residents in the mid-50s when both of those projects opened up. And um, the thing about it is that Bonton was still located in a floodplain. So this is a, this is a, uh, oh, I'm going, this is a picture of Bear Street, which runs right through the heart of Bonton. It's the main street that goes through our neighborhood. This is a picture after one of the spring rains when the community flooded. Still to this day, if you come to Bonton, there's usually two ways in and two ways out of our neighborhood, but we're having construction now, so there's only one way in and one way out. But if you were to go to under one of the underpasses in and out of our neighborhood, you would notice these huge steel gates. Those steel gates were made that when it would flood, they would close those steel gates to keep the water in to keep it from flooding the rest of the city. Those steel gates are still hanging on there today. We've, they haven't been used in a long time. But in 1996, the city built a levee that then prevented and protected our neighborhood from flooding. So from 1953 or 54, when the public housing developments were built, up until the time that 1996, when the levee was built, our community flooded every year. Um, in 2009, federal government decided that the old school method of public housing wasn't good. The idea of congregating a bunch of poor people together in one housing development led to more problems. Bonton, while um, always an impoverished and challenged community, used to be a really strong community. You have to understand that freed slaves whose families had been divided and torn apart were used to living together and doing for one another and really being community in a way that many of us don't understand. Uh, one of my good friends and one of the first people I met when I moved to Bonton is a guy named Jerry. Uh, Jerry um, and I got in a fight the first night that we ever, when I moved to Bonton, uh, he showed up drunk and high and I um, had to draw a line in the sand and that line in the sand led to us having a small altercation and I thought, you know, he's gonna come back and kill me. And instead, the next day, he showed up and said, I'm sorry. Uh, he said, I've been this way since I was six years old. And I said, what happened when you were six? And he said, well, I was a product of a rape. Uh, my mom wanted to have me, but every time she held me, she revisited this trauma that happened in her life and just couldn't take it. So she gave me away to a family down here. Today, that sounds weird, but to a freeman's community that were used to taking care of one another and each other's kids as families were torn apart and had to move, not an uncommon thing. This family truly took Jerry in as their own. And when Jerry was six years old, they were all in a car wreck and they died and he lived. And so as a six-year-old, he found himself in a really difficult situation in a very broken and harsh environment, and he's figured out how to survive to this point. One of the things that I will just say about my neighborhood in uh, Bonton is that uh, the people there, if you would just take the time to get to know them, are some of the most beautiful, resilient uh, people. I'll never forget one day after Jerry and I's friendship started to form, um, I came home from what I thought was a hard day at work. And I was like, Jerry, I just need a little bit of time. I had a rough day. And he's like, well, what happened? And I said, I really don't want to talk about it. I just had a rough day. And he said, no, you make me tell you what I'm going through. You tell me what you're going through. So I, I told him what my rough day was and he said, shit, that's not a hard day. <laughs> and so, you know, I gain as much. I, just, I say that story just to say that 
that we all have so much to offer one another that mainly because we have so many differences or perceived differences, we never take the time to truly understand. But I can tell you that I am a much better and, and a richer person because of the relationships I have with people that until I was 47, never knew. I, I didn't move to Bonton until I was 47. I didn't know a lot of the problems that we have existed until I got involved, until I became a neighbor to, to the people that live there. And I just can tell you that I'm a much richer and better man for it. Um, so when Bonton, um, the public housing came, we had a confluence of problems. We had the great white flight, people moving to the suburbs. We had the end of the Vietnam War where we had vets coming back that had all kinds of issues, drug issues, uh, PTSD, other kinds of things. Um, we have poor people, when you, ha when you own nothing, then, then things that you can control mean something. So you may not understand turf wars or why a certain area or block means something, but when I don't own my own place or have anything of my own, then all of a sudden the corner of Bear and Valentine means something. And so this is my area. And so then you start to have turf wars. We had two public housing developments on catty corner parts of the neighborhood, and it created this conflict about who has what area. And all of a sudden, gangs started to form. Never were there gangs before. But all of a sudden, in order to survive, to protect our territory, we had gangs form. And so through public housing and the confluence of these other issues around Great White Flight and the end of the Vietnam War and, and, and other things, we had Bonton started to deteriorate. Uh, and in fact, it became one known as one of the worst neighborhoods in the city. You can talk to people in my neighborhood that have been to prison, and if you're in prison and you have a Bonton tattoo, you have respect um, because it's a tough place. And people respect that. Um, so this kind of tells a story of what happened in Bonton after the public housing came, drugs and crime and all kinds of things began to lead to our decline. Um, and then after they tore the projects down in 2012, um, shortly after that, our community went from 6,000 down to about 1,200 people overnight as 4,000 people were displaced into other areas of town. So um, the city does a survey and finds out where we're going to spend our, bu our budget money for school. And in 2012, they shut our school down. So if one thing I want to say is if you're from Bonton, all of those things aren't separate events. If you grow up there and you live there, from the end of slavery to my school closing down in 2013, those are all somewhat related. You know, it's not, an, it's not a separate thing. And so a lot of times for somebody like me, I might look at that and say, gosh, slave, slavery was before, way before I was born, way before my parents were born. I don't understand how that still impacts our culture today, but the fact of it is, is whether we're aware of it or not, we still have things that exist today that are happening in our neighborhoods in South Dallas and in Bonton and around our country that impact the people that live there in a way that what I'm really here to talk to you today is about food. How in the world do we have neighborhoods in a city as rich as Dallas where we have people that are sick and dying because they don't have access to food? Without the context of understanding where we came from, I'm not so sure that this would make sense. So thank you for bearing with me through that background. Um, this is a picture of, of our neighborhood today. Um, we have three beer and wine stores, or two beer and wine stores and a liquor store in our neighborhood. That's where people buy food. Um, we don't have access to a grocery store. The nearest grocery store to us is a three hour round trip bus ride away. Um, this particular liquor store got shut down two years ago for selling heroin out of it, so they're not the kind of places that um, you want your family going into to buy food, but this is where we have to buy food. So the things that are available there, um, I can buy a honey bun there, I can buy probably the closest thing to real food might be a can of Vienna sausages or something like that, but it's not real food, and the fact of the matter of the way our human body works, if you eat off fake food long enough, your body starts to rebel and shut down. And so in our neighborhood, we have more than double the rate of cancer, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, and childhood obesity than the county we're in. So Bonton is, da is in Dallas County. We would be, to use a, a visual, we would be like a donut hole in Dallas County. So if you take the health statistics of Dallas County and just take out the donut hole of Bonton, we have more than double the rate of 
cancer, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, and childhood obesity. So when I moved to Bonton, um, my new neighbors that came and introduced me trying to find out what branch I, of law enforcement I worked for, at the, at the end of those conversations, I would always say, I, I, I literally moved to Bonton to try to just be a good neighbor. I wanted to understand. I wanted to be a neighbor. I didn't want to live in this bubble anymore where I was separate from people that didn't, that were different than me. Um, I wanted to get to know this neighborhood and to try to be a good neighbor. And I would always ask this question in those introductions. I have no idea if I have anything to offer or not, but if there were anything I could do, what would it be? And for the first six months I lived there, every single person I met said jobs. Briefly to touch on that, um, in our city, if you were to draw a line across Woodall Rogers, not far from where we are, what percentage of the population lives north of that line? Because it's a big room, I'll tell you, 55%. What percentage of the population lives south of that line? 45%. <laughs> what percentage of jobs are north of that line? 98%. So we have almost half the population living where 2% of the jobs are. If you understand poverty at all, not food, but poverty, one of the biggest encumbrances or symptoms of poverty is the limited ability for transportation and mobility to get to goods and services. So if I have a hard time getting three and a half miles to the nearest grocery store, it's easy for people like us to go, well, there's jobs all over Dallas. There's help wanted signs everywhere, which is true but those help wanted signs are in a part of town where I can't get to. And so um, I think part of what I hope to do today is to try to draw us into a conversation about maybe we don't understand each other well enough to have the compassion we need to truly change things. So one of the things I was challenged with, how do we actually change things? One of the things we have to do in, a, in an organization like the Rotary Club is a great place to start, is we have to start to understand one another better. And to do that, we have to get to know each other. We have to be able to sit down and listen. Um, just more, more uh, pictures of our neighborhood. <coughs> this thing kind of goes on its own. <coughs> um, so. Um, I, everybody told me for the first six months job, so I made a deal with the guys that I uh, met, and most of them were all men, and I had a barbecue. And I said, look, I don't know if you know this or not, but over six months I've had a chance to meet you all. We've all had different conversations, but we've all had one conversation that was the same, and that was I asked every one of you if there was anything I could do to help, what would it be? And every single one of you said jobs, and I don't even know if you all know that or not. They didn't know that. So we started talking, is jobs our greatest challenge? And if they are, if, jo if jobs are our greatest challenge, what are we going to do about it? And so we set out to start building resumes. Most of us, when you ask the, ask the people we were talking to, what value do you have to offer a company, you would get a lot of blank stares. A lot of the people had been through really difficult life circumstances. Many of them didn't have a tremendous amount of education or work experience. In our neighborhood, we haven't graduated more than 55% of our kids in the last 50 years. And so, just so happens that about half of our men will go to prison before their 25th birthday. Those two things aren't unlinked. Uh, and so, we have had these challenges. So, how do we prepare ourselves in a way that we do have something to offer of value to an employer? So we started working together to clean up our community. And we would build resumes while doing that. And almost immediately, the people that agreed to work with me in that program started calling in sick. And I was like, oh, no, you can't do that. Uh, the one thing you have to be if you want a job is you have to be dependable. So you cannot call in sick. The thing that I hadn't known from all of my time in Bonton, I volunteered there a year before I moved in, is that my new neighbors were sick. They were sick and not just sick, but sick and dying. You, you don't see diabetes on the outside. I don't, I don't know any of you in here, but I would assume some of you have diabetes. I, I wouldn't know it. Uh, you don't see heart disease on the outside. That's something that happens to the inside. Some of us in here probably are battling cancer. Some of us may have cancer and not even know it. You don't know that. It happens to you from the inside out. So all of that time in Bonton, I didn't know that my neighbors were sick. But all of a sudden, when they start saying, I can't come to work. I, I have dialysis Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. What's dialysis? I didn't know it. I'd never heard of dialysis. And so I was confronted with this whole nother understanding. Why is this? I thought, first of all, selfishly, 
am I going to get sick too? Everybody around me sick. Is there something here? Is this like a Flint, Michigan where our water's bad? And am I going to get sick too? And when I learned that it was simply because we don't have access to food, I just thought, what a tragedy. How wrong is that? And, and what are we going to do about it? This is unacceptable. And so we planted a garden and soon learned that in the city of Dallas, it was illegal to have a garden that you sold food from. And so we began an effort with a whole bunch of other people to work with the city of Dallas, who has been very supportive, but work with the city of Dallas to change the ordinances to allow market gardens, gardens you sell things uh, from, to be legal. And so in that conversation, we wound up uh, getting about a block, a city block of land, an acre and a quarter of land. This is what it looks like. Just so when people give you land, they don't generally give you good land. <clears throat> And so we, we had no tools. We, had, we went to Walmart and we bought machetes and we were out there with machetes and some people came by and said, what in the world are you doing? And we're like, we're clearing these lots. We're gonna build a farm here. And they're like, you can't do that with machetes. It's all we have. Well, we have some people that have chainsaws. So the next weekend out, we go out with chainsaws. We're out there with chainsaws and people come by. What are you doing? You can't do that with chainsaws. This is all we've got. Well, I know a friend that has a bulldozer. So I, this is a story of kind of how we progress from uh, from chainsaws to, uh, or from machetes to bulldozers, but eventually we cleared the land and this is our farm today. Um, so we have an acre and a quarter farm in the neighborhood, which really um, is not about the farm at all. Yes, we have a problem with food and we wanna feed people. And one of the answers, one of the solutions to the food problem is to grow our own food. You know what else growing food does? Creates jobs. And it creates a place where people can learn to become employable, learn to be valuable, learn how to provide value back to an employer. So it's more than just a farm. Um, I, I won't say that this is uh, the only solution to our food problem, but it is a solution. I don't know if you know this or not, but about half of all the land in South Dallas is empty. And so certainly when you have empty available land that has no purpose but to be blighted and to be overgrown and to pay the city millions of dollars every year to try to keep it up and mow it would be to convert more of it into urban farms and urban gardens. And so for us, one of the solutions would be to grow our own food. Um, now the question becomes, how do you get that food into the hands of the people that need it? And so for about four years, people have come up to those barns that you see right there. They walk up across a vacant lot to get there and they buy food from under the barn. Um, our goal when we started was to try to sell $1,000 of food a, a month. Um, last year, or last month, we sold over $20,000 of food in just the month of June. And so um, it's grown. We have not just people learning to work, but kids learning about the land and where food comes from. Um, they love the farm and the animals. Uh, they learn how to work and how, what it takes to grow food. Uh, this is Patrick, the original farm manager at the small farm with a group bunch of kids from the neighborhood um, preparing to plant a row. And ultimately, one of the things I've learned is there's nothing more dangerous in this world than a person without hope. Um, but I will also tell you there's nothing more powerful than a person with hope. And so more than everything, whether it be jobs or whether it be food or whether it be transportation and mobility or whether it be affordable housing or whether it be proper education, all of these are foundational and fundamental problems that are voids in many of our inner city, inner city and underserved communities. Ultimately, what we're trying to do through all that we offer is, is grow hope. Um, and then lastly, if I can do it, I think I screwed it up. But we're building a market and cafe. The last slide was a picture of that. Uh, we hope to, hope to be open in the next 45 days. But for the first time in 50 years, our neighborhood will have a place where they can sit down and eat a meal together. And oh, this is the market and cafe. And so we'll be open for breakfast and lunch. So our neighborhood will have a place to come down and sit down and eat together. We don't have, I know this is gonna sound strange, but we don't have even like a McDonald's. There's not a single place in our neighborhood where people can sit down and eat together. And so this will be a place to do that, but it'll also be a fresh neighborhood and market and cafe. And so this certainly isn't the solution. In fact, my friend Brad Boa works with a, an organization that he started called Food Desert Solutions, where they're trying to take these issues and, 
and dive deeper into understanding all of the different ways that we can do that. Um, but for our neighborhood, this is the way that we're solving the problem. And one of the things that I would just challenge you in closing is that as you guys invest in our neighborhood and as you guys give back and as you guys support financially organizations that are doing good in our city, I, I will just make this plea. We have given too much too long to putting Band-Aids over things that never change. And as a result, those things that aren't changing are growing. And if we are going to make a difference in our city and start to address these macro trends that we talked about that are so problematic, we have to start demanding for solutions, things that permanently change things. And so if the things you invest in aren't permanently changing something, I would just ask you to second guess it and to look for things that truly are changing the status quo. Uh, because we need, desperately, our city needs true transformation and change in this area and many more. So thank you so much for your time. I, do I have time for questions or did I talk too long? Did I, did I talk too long? So I have five minutes if anybody has a question. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it was that made you decide to go to Montana? So the question was, he wanted to know a little bit more about me and why, what made me decide to move to Bonton. And I will tell you that I, I didn't decide to move to Bonton. I think Bonton chose me. Um, I, um, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I tried to take that seriously. Um, and if I take that seriously for me, then that requires me to care for, uh, actually, it doesn't even require it. It's just supposed to be something that happens inside of you. And I'll tell you, until that happened in my life, I was the most selfish person I had ever met. And my life has changed since that point, and I began to care about other people for the first time in my life. And then through a friend, I got introduced to Bonton, and I fell in love with him. And ultimately, I volunteered there for a year on Saturdays, going down there for two hours every Saturday, meeting with a group of men that were coming out of prison and trying not to go back. And um, that became the highlight of my week. And um, it begs the question, why was, it so, why was it giving me so much value in life? Is it just making me feel better about who I am? Because the fact of the matter was the people I said I care about weren't changing at all. Two hours on a Saturday is not enough to change a person. And so if I really cared, it was going to require more of me. And I wrestled through that question. And ultimately, I really did care. And if I really did care and was serious about what I said I believed, then I had to do something about it. And so... I left my career and moved down there. Yes, sir. So what help do you need to move forward um, <laughs> in your plan? Man, I'll, I'll tell you the biggest challenge we have in our city overall is we have this gap of understanding. Uh, our city's divided. Our neighborhoods are segregated. I can go up north where I used to live, and there's signs that say homes from the 750s to a million, homes from the millions to a million and a half. We've divided our population by how much you make. And so if I don't live in your area, you, I don't understand you and you don't understand me. I have found the people of Dallas to be some of the most amazing people in the world. And I'm not just saying that because I'm filled with a room of you today and I want you to like me. I really, I really believe Dallas can set a mark for the city to be different. Um, but it's going to require us coming together and understanding one another. And so one of the ways that you can make the biggest difference is to be a part of that uniting factor to where we get people that are different together and start talking. You can start challenging people about these ideas. The conversations are everywhere. We have some great writers, Robert Walensky, and uh, there's a guy from uh, the Dallas Observer that write great stories about some of the great challenges we have in our city. And if you just read it and put that down and never act on it, nothing changes. And so we have to be about coming together to understand one another. And I believe that if we did that, we wouldn't have to do any more work because it would solve itself. People will respond. Um, secondly, um, as an organization ourselves, we can't do this without the support of others. We have a really easy program if you believe in what we do. Uh, it's called Friends of the Farm. You can go to our website and if you can give $10 a month or $20 a month, it helps support our organization so that we can give back to the people we're serving. Um, that small monthly donation multiplied across big groups in the city makes it less of a burden for anybody, but everybody gets to be a part of giving back. Um, there's, there's, 
there's other great organizations that are truly transforming things in our city. Brad's on the board of an organization called Miles of Freedom, um, another fantastic group and organization. There's another restaurant right down here called Cafe Momentum, where they're taking people, young people that, that our world has given up on, and they're giving them hope and loving on them and telling them that they have value and that they can give back. And they're taking people that we would wind up paying for for the rest of their lives because they're going to be in our system, in our criminal justice system. And they're giving them hope so that they don't go back. Um, so there's great organizations that are truly changing our city. And to invest in those things that are changing things, I think, would be a great idea. Um, Thirdly, uh, to get out and volunteer because when you volunteer, you come face to face with the people and the problems, and that gives you a deeper understanding and compassion of how to get involved to make a difference. So I think those would be the top three things uh, that I would say that this group could do or individually you could do to get involved and to start changing the status quo. Yes, sir. What, if any, I hate politics and I'm not fond of many politicians if really I don't know that I like any politicians but um, so I try I try to stay removed from that but I'll tell you my perspective because I've worked with them and I've found our city to be very supportive I think they're clueless and I don't mean that in a negative way. I think that they desperately want to see things change. I think they have no idea how to go about it. In conversations with our current mayor, um, I know that he loves what he sees in the organizations that I mentioned, but he thinks we're too small to change the city. And, and my argument with that is everything great starts small and grows into something big, and government wants to see something big that winds up impacting small. I don't think it'll ever happen that way. So until our government starts to, until our local government starts to look at small things that are working and do invest in them to scale, we're going to always have this challenge because they're lurking for some grand solution that's all of a sudden going to sweep down and change everything. I, and personally, I just don't believe that'll ever happen. I, I think it's going to be small things that start with really powerful um, transformation ability and then to say, how do we take what that happened when that person and scale it? I'll tell you in my neighborhood, um, I look at Kim and I look at Patrick that you saw in those videos and I tell them this all the time. No, our community in South Dallas will never change because of me. It will change because of you. Your neighborhood, your neighbors see somebody that grew up that's like them, that went through the same things they went through and then they see you overcome it and then all of a sudden they start to think if they can do it, I can do it. And that's where change happens. So we need to invest in people from our neighborhoods to be the leaders. I hope I'm not in Bonton in five years because I hope if I've done my job well, I've raised up a local leader so that I'm no longer necessary. And that's where true change is gonna happen. But it's gonna start small and it's gonna grow big. And right now our city looks at it inver inversely. Yes, sir. I have to admit that I'm a recovery politician. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm glad you're in recovery. <laughs> and one great uh, lesson learned for me among many in my life was in 2003 and 4 when a fellow councilman named Leo Cheney Jr. and I fought for federal funds to create a project called the Bear Street Renewal Project. Yes, sir. No. It's not a, it's, to me, it's not a top-down issue. It's a proven point in spades because it's, it's a leadership issue. It's, it's a community hub. You have a lot of potential in these cultures. You, you just have to put it because you, you tell them to see what they can do. So my question is, if it's not a top-down issue, and it's really not a government issue, but you need government you need resources to the government to get out of the way. Right. Urban missionaries, or, or 
Oh, I think they're there. I just don't. So, the, so first of all, he said he's a politician in recovery. So everybody, give him a round of applause. <laughs> the second of all, his his question was that it, he he thinks that we through this conversation today that it's proven that it's not a top down approach, but it's a bottom up approach. And how do we empower more people? Um, to do things like what's happening at Miles of Freedom and Bonton Farms and Cafe Momentum to do what they do. And, and I would just argue that those people, two things, and this is my opinion, we've created an environment of, uh, there's, in fact, there's a documentary called Poverty Inc. We've created an industry of poverty. There's, there's entire organizations sucking up m hundreds of millions of dollars to to not solve a problem, but to keep it the way it is. And it sounds harsh, but if you're not solving a problem, you're propping it up. And so for every person that I feed, that I don't teach or empower how to feed themselves, I'm creating another somebody that needs me. And, and so I would, I would again challenge you to look for things that are empowering people to change and to have the power to change themselves. They're out there. And divert that resources and hundreds of million dollars to those people that are changing things because there's people out there that are starving to death trying to do the right thing because we have huge organizations that have national reputations that people give hundreds of millions of dollars to that don't change a thing. And if we could just focus on our city and what, what's really being done here, there's a lot of people that are starving to death, out fighting to do the right thing. I, 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 and again, I'm not, I'm not a paid spokesperson for Miles of Freedom, but I'm a big believer in what they do. And I'll tell you, this guy served wrongfully 15 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. He got, convi he got convicted when he was 19. And he came out and he got not anything worth giving 15 years of your life for, but he got some money for that in restitution. And instead of taking, I lost 15 years of my life, I'm gonna live for me, he invested it in an organization to help people not go back to prison. Um, that's a guy you need to invest in. Um, but I know that it's been a struggle. He barely gets by. and. And for somebody doing real work that's really transformative, I don't think that should be. You know, we have, we have. You come to my house, Bonton Farms. Um, we office out of our home. I can go down to some of the big national um, charities, and they live in some of the most affluent, nice office buildings with staff everywhere. I don't have a secretary because I have people that I serve that are homeless. How can I have a secretary? How can I afford an office when I have people that don't have a place to stay? I can't justify that. And so look at, look at what you do and demand a return on investment that changes things. And if the people that care did that, our city would change because there's people there fighting the battles. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm curious about the cost that it takes to start an acre farm. What is the typical startup cost for? There's not a typical startup cost. It depends on what's there, how bad the land is that you're, give, that you're given, if you have to buy the land, are there fences there, do you have any kind of equipment. There's a whole bunch of variables that go into it. I can tell you we had nothing and got the worst land, and it, we probably spent $70,000 to take that acre and a quarter and to turn it into, we have, we have really nice buildings and really nice fences and uh, we imported really good compost because our soil wouldn't grow anything. Uh, some of our soil was contaminated that we had to remediate. All that cost money. And so for us, that acre and a quarter was pretty expensive. Um, for others, it might not be so much, but it really depends on what you start with. Thank you guys so much for your time. Great questions, and I think Darren will have a little bit of time um, maybe afterwards to answer a few more questions if y'all want to stick around. And Darren, I've got a couple of things for you, so you sat down too quickly. Um, in, in, um, whoop, let me just see here. There we are. Thank you, guys. In recognition of your presentation today, we just have a few small tokens that we want to give you, but this is a history book of the Rotary Club of Dallas, but it's been personalized for you. Oh, you. So on the inside, we've got several members who have signed and given you a personal message just to let you know how much your presentation you so means much. to us. Yeah, Absolutely. You. And then one other little thing. I love presents. This, uh, <laughs> I hope you'll put this on your desk somewhere just to remind you, because while you're making what appears to be a small difference here in Dallas. I think you're making ripples across the planet with what you're doing and 
um, instilling hope in so many people, and that's that's a big thing. So this is just a little memento of that, and I'll put that in the box for you. Okay. But we appreciate you so much, and thank I hope you. you'll stick around and answer more questions because everyone's intrigued. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, you guys, next week is our club assembly. So this is an opportunity for you to bring your passions. We're gonna have some hands-on opportunities in this room to do some service that's gonna help promote our teacher awards and our trip to Ghana. So come prepared to roll up your sleeves and have some fun and do some good work. Um, and that's a members only thing, by the way, because we're gonna be using it as a working day. So next week in this room, hands-on club assembly. Next, immediately following this meeting, um, starting about 1.15 or so, we have a board of directors meeting. So that'll be back here in the hallway behind me. Anybody, by the way, is welcome to attend a board of directors meeting. I just want to state that for the record. Um, so we want to make sure our board of directors are there and anyone else who wants to attend, feel welcome. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all again next week. I hope every single person who came today will come again next week who's a member of our club because it's going to be great. Um, remember as you go throughout your day today and the rest of this week, share the gift of Rotary, continue to be people of action, and be the inspiration. Now Rotarians and visiting Rotarians, please stand and let's recite the four-way test. Of all the things we think, say, and do, first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth, is it fun? Yes, it is. Thank you so much. We're adjourned. See you around.